This is Brooks Savage, head basketball coach at East Tennessee State University, and you're listening to the No Playbook Podcast. All right. Hey, thanks for checking out the show. It's the podcast where we talk with the outstanding athletes, coaches, and experts that help to make sports and fitness such an important part of life in the Southeast. Uh, if you're a basketball fan in East Tennessee, make sure you check out my last two episodes. I had uh, Lady Vol Tess Darby on the last episode, and then the one right before that, John Fulkerson, VFL, who's now playing uh, pro ball in Belgium. I'm guessing uh, most of the listeners on this episode probably big ETSU Bucks fans. You're coming here to listen to new head coach Brooks Savage talk about what fans can expect uh, with ETSU this season. Well, I want to let you know that uh, this coming up weekend, ETSU is going to be hosting an open basketball practice. Uh, I'll be there to watch the team. Then I'm going to be heading over to the football stadium to watch the uh, Mercer game. It's homecoming this weekend at ETSU. So, uh, new head coach, Brooks Savage, very cool guy. Nice enough to join me on the podcast to uh, just talk about his coaching experience. Uh, he actually started at uh, UT. He was even one of the managers at Tennessee when he was a student. Uh, we talk about his experience in the Johnson City area, and you'll get to learn a little bit more about just who he is as a dude. It was a great chat, and uh, I'm actually hoping to find some time to hang out with him this weekend at the football game. But I'll get right to Brooks Savage, that interview, right after this. Sit tight. Recruit Me puts the recruiting process in your hands. Most student athletes wait for college coaches to discover them, but coaches are busy and don't always have the time to find them. Recruit Me allows you to build an online profile to share directly with college coaches and is designed to help you enter all of the information coaches want to see. Your stats, your highlight videos, your academic information, your social links, and more. Plus, our team is here to make sure that your profile stands out with personalized suggestions. With over 25,000 coaches in our database, our premium plan gives you access to D1, D2, D3, and NAIA coaches across the country, and more importantly, gives them access to you. Enter your schedule of games and tournaments to let coaches know when and where you're playing so they can come out and watch you shine. Then communicate with interested coaches via our chat feature. When it comes to recruiting, don't make coaches research you. Do the work for them. Get started today at the Recruit Me app, on the web, and in the app stores. At D1 Training, what we do is in our name. Our D1 athletes become D1 athletes. Whether it's Los Angeles Angels pitcher Ben Joyce, high school soccer national MVP Brindley Murphy, or first-round NFL draft pick Cole Strange, we help all athletes reach their full potential. Five-star training system comes straight from D1 strength and conditioning programs, and D1 has trained over 2,000 professional athletes. Many of them started as young as seven years old. Check out D1Training.com to learn more about their facilities in Hardin Valley and Sevierville, and coming very soon to Maryville and the Tri-Cities. I'm going to be honest, and I wonder if you have heard this uh, a couple times to different people. I've said, uh, they've asked, who, who have you got on the, who are you going to interview today? And I've accidentally called you Ben Savage a couple times. <laughs> um, I've been called a lot worse. Yeah. <laughs> it just It's just that name Savage. I mean, we've got Fred, we've got Ben. It's just... Uh, so Fred said that was Wonder Years, is that right? Yes. And then ben, who's Ben? Ben is his younger brother that was Boy Meets World. Boy Meets World. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy Meets World. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with were, you, you. were you not a Topanga guy? Oh, I was a Topanga guy, but I can't, I couldn't keep them straight. And then we had one one guy was the quarterback at Rutgers for a little while. Oh, well, I don't know that. I know yeah, the Savage. Really- yeah, yeah, it was he was a savage. Yeah, I don't know. So. Uh, well, cool, man. Well, uh, well, thanks for joining me. So, yeah, you did spend a lot of time here. You went to school at UT, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's where I got my start. I was a, um, I was a Tennessee fan growing up, and um, you know, since like Andy Kelly and Heath Schuler were playing quarterback and. Um, so that's really the only place I ever wanted to go. And then, um, I know I wanted to coach, so it kind of worked out. I was able to get on as a manager and, um, that's how I got started. 
It's really cool. You know, there's a guy that uh, worked here and was a uh, coach at D1. He did a lot of work with basketball players, and now he's basically trying to get on as a as a manager. And we've talked to him about just like, I don't think you realize there's a lot of work that goes into that. Yeah, it's it's uh it's not the most glamorous job. I'm I'm gonna tell you, you're not gonna you're not you're not pulling any girls by telling them you're a basketball manager. I can promise you. Um, but it was for me, it was like the best thing ever. That's that's all I wanted to do. I mean, I was I was in there twenty four seven. I just I, I never wanted to go to class. I just wanted to be in the office and be around the game and in the gym. And um, for me, it was great. So that wasn't like a huge flex at a party. Like I'm one of the managers. No, not like, at all. Not at all. Like but you I see those jerseys. People, yeah, I, you know, I think I think when yeah, right. I think when people um when we started winning and and um you know, I, I think I don't think people like look down upon it. I just don't think it was like the most glamorous thing. And you know, you miss out on a lot of stuff, you know, whether it be birthday parties or weddings or you know you know like like you do in the coaching profession but you also miss out on like leaving class and like going to the pool you know or like having afternoon classes you know stuff like that just it's just a little bit for me at least it was a little bit different of a of a commitment you know i was there to learn how to become a coach that's why i went to college i wasn't really there for any any other reason um that and the social scene um so you know for me it was that was all it's all i've ever wanted to do so it was a blast and 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 yeah. it, you know you miss out on some of that stuff but you also get some experiences that no one else you know is able to have like you know you're going to the ncaa tournament or you know we went to europe you know you're you're the sweet 16 you're you know doing all that fun stuff playing at all the places we played rup you know, Kansas, just, you know, went to the Virgin Islands. So you get to do a lot of cool stuff that other people don't get to do too. Who were some of those players on that team when you were a manager? Uh, I got there in 04. Coach Buzz Peterson was the head coach. Um, we had like C.J. Watson was the point guard. Chris Lofton was a freshman. Me and him were in the same same class, I guess you would say. Uh, he lived right above me in the dorm. Um really good friends with him still. Um, and then Coach Pearl came in my sophomore year, and that was like Wayne Chisholm's freshman year. Well, no, that wouldn't have been. That would have been like Dane Bradshaw, CJ. It was pretty much the whole team was was back. Um, my, and then my junior year was like Wayne Chisholm and, and, and that group. And, um, you know, Tyler Smith came in and that eventually. And then – like J.P. Prince, Bobby May, Scotty Hobson, you know, those guys were kind of the the group that went to the Elite Eight. So, um, yeah. but, yeah, some some good players, man. You know, I think it's really interesting that most of the time you hear of coaches, like a head coach in D1 basketball is a guy that, that played D1 basketball. And I think it's pretty neat that you went in with the idea on the front end of being a coach. Yeah, I mean, I was lucky to have some really – uh, influential people in my life when I was younger that were my coaches and so that's you know I think like of course every kid wants to play college basketball wants to play in the NBA but I was such a late bloomer physically like that wasn't really going to happen for me and um, you know so I could have played like some small college ball somewhere in the Carolinas probably but it was that that never interested me I wanted to I wanted to go to Tennessee and I wanted to learn how to be a coach and so um you know, I, I was I was lucky. Like, I had a great high school coach and Tim Whipple at Irmo High School in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, I had some other really influential people growing up that were my coaches. My dad coached me. I think that that helped me fall in love with the game. I was able to kind of see at an early age kind of the impact that he was able to have, like up close with players. Um, you know, and so um, yeah, I think I mean there's a number of. You know, and then I got to work for Coach Pearl, who started as a manager for five years. So that was really cool because I was able to go in there every day and see somebody, you know, who once sat where I'm sitting currently, and now he's the head coach of Tennessee. And maybe I can do that too. And, you know, I think our managers think that it's – now it's – you get held to a different standard because he did all the stuff he's asking you to do. And I think our managers and, 
young guys are kind of figuring that out a little bit here. Um, but, you know, you look around, there's a number of great coaches that weren't great players. And I think that, um, you know, you just – you get a head start because while they're playing and then they go on to play professionally most likely, like that's a that's a great experience. And that's – you know, there's been guys that have, that have taken that path that are really successful too. But, like, I was – I was so much further ahead when it came to coaching and doing, knowing how to do the job, scouting report, how to recruit, how to, you know, just do the million different tasks in the office. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a great experience, but, uh, you know, you can take a lot of different paths. It's kind of the one, one profession that I can think of that doesn't have like a natural career progression. Like if there was, if there was one way to do it, we'd all be doing that, but it's unique in that way. So, um, you know, it's pretty cool that you can kind of get where you want to go. A lot of different, different, different avenues. Absolutely. Well, now you're, it's your first season as a head coach. How, uh, how are you approaching things differently than even in your past many seasons as an assistant? Uh, it's just, it's different. You know, I think you feel, um, look, the job's the job, like any, any high level assistant coach and not, I'm not talking about high major. I'm just talking about any assistant coach that's really good. They know how to do the job. Like they know how to, you know, kind of the day to day things that go on in the program. I think, I think that's what really helps me is that I have a pretty good, I mean, I've worked every job. I started as a manager, been a GA, a video Adobo assistant coach at low major, mid major, high major Juco. Like I've kind of got a pretty good, 360 degree view of what this should look like and how this is run at different. So, um, you know, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's different because you have to, there's so many decisions to be made and you're in charge and everyone's, you know, kind of looking at you for direction and leadership. Um, and then the, the weight of those decisions affect so many people. And so um, I think that that you can feel the weight of that at times. There's a lot more time that go into planning and organizing for all the different stuff that, that you have to do, whether it be, you know, especially in year one, when you're trying to get it how you want it, you know, how you want your program to run. And, you know, from the travel to the gear, to the facility, locker room, to how you want to play, you know, then, then to also like, you know, delegating responsibilities you know, to the staff, you know, that so that everybody can can do what they're best at and they're operating and, and kind of play into their strengths like you would your players and that they feel valued and, and everybody feels, you know, like they have some ownership in this thing. And so, and then you have 13, 15 players that you got to, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people you have to touch every day, a lot of attention, you know, that you have to, to that, that they need. And that's not a bad thing. It just is what it is. And so I, I think that, I don't think you really get understand that like you do, you know, as an, as, as an assistant, like you do when you get your opportunity, but it's, it's like anything. It's like becoming a dad. Like you don't really know, you know, that that bottle is coming every three hours, man. And you just don't really, you don't grasp that. Somebody can tell you, but then like, you just, it's just one of those things you got to figure out as you go. But luckily for us, we got a great staff. So they make it really easy on me. Um, and they're 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 really really good, man. And so I'm I'm lucky in that ways. But uh, those two are probably the biggest, um, you know, thing that that I feel kind of on a daily basis. That's such a great analogy. It's like being a dad because you, you you hear about it, you see it on TV. You know, this can't be that hard. And then uh, <laughs> they hand you the baby, and you're like, wait. <laughs> to the nurse, right. like, what you're leaving? Yeah, you know, it's like you know, the one knock on any first year head coach is that they've never been a head coach before, but it's like, you know, I was never an assistant coach before either. I was never a dad before. Like it's just part of it. Either you can do it or you can't, either gonna, you're either going to figure out how to do it or you're, or you're not. And, and so, but it's, you know, a lot of it is um, surrounding yourself with great people. I've been lucky. I've had great teachers along the way, you know, coach Forbes, you know, I said at my press conference, like, why I haven't yet sat in this seat, I couldn't have sat any closer. And so I was prepared as I possibly could be. You know, I've, like I said, worked every job. I've been at every level. I don't know really what much more there was to do. I had actually, coach had actually gave me the opportunity to coach a game 
at Wake Forest against Georgia Tech. And so, you know, it's it was eventually you just got to go do it. You got to go get in the batter's box and and, and go uh, go take some cuts. And uh, speaking of Wake Forest and Coach Forbes, I just want to mention real quick, I've gotten luckily to experience a lot of that. I had a buddy that played at Wake Forest uh, in the days of Chris Paul, uh, Justin Gray, was it Eric Williams? So yeah, Ron Downey, was an awesome teams. Great team. They were number one in the nation for, you know, a cup of coffee for a minute there. Yeah. And it was it was so much fun. So we would travel to Winston-Salem to go watch him play, and he would get us seats, like, on the floor. And it was so much fun getting to watch that experience. Oh, I mean, there's been some moments in history where Wake Forest has been as, as good as anybody, man. And, and, I mean, national championship caliber teams, you know, Tim Duncan, uh, you know, those teams. But then the, the, the teams that you just mentioned, and then some really great players that's come through there, Josh Howard, Jeff Teague, Ish Smith. Um, you know, I'd put the Wake Forest pros up against just about anybody, man. They got some really good ones. I mean, you got two Hall of Famers. Yeah. And, uh, and my buddy, his name is Scott Feather. He was the guy – uh, that they put in to like hard foul JJ Redick, that kind of thing. <laughs> they did start a goon on JJ Redick one game. Was that him? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, no, nah, but I mean, some great coaches have come through there, really great players. I mean, they got, they have some people within the program, you know, Mitch Shaw and, and you know, John Curry's the AD. I mean, there's some really, they want to win. They're really committed to basketball. It's a great place. A great place. I was so fortunate to to be in the ACC, to be at Wake Forest, a place where it's, you know, world-class books and basketball. I mean, you get the best of both worlds, and, and I don't think you get that a lot of places. So what it was an incredible experience. I remember going to the ACC tournament when I was like 10, you know, and Rasheed Wallace is down there playing with Carolina. And, I mean, I went again. I went numerous times. I mean, watch Steve Blake and Jason Williams go at it in, uh, I guess, 01 maybe. Um, but like, and then to have the chance to like coach in the ACC, it was, it was incredible. You know, you look down there and there's like a few nights a year, there's like a thousand wins, you know, you got Jim Beheim, Mike Krzyzewski, Roy, I mean, it's like some, some guys that have, that are, that are the best that have ever done it. So it was awesome getting to prepare for those people night in, night out, Tony Bennett, you know, how are you going to get in the paint? How are you going to? handle the post trap, you know, Leonard Hamilton plays a different style, another hall of famer, you know? And so it was, it was great coaches every night. You better be, you better be prepared. Cause yeah. they know what they're doing down there and they got good players too. <laughs> uh, I grew up actually in the Eastern part of the state and we would go to a lot of NC state games. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, I grew up an ACC guy. And like when I was a little kid, Chris Corciani, uh, Rodney Monroe, like yeah, Tom Gugliotta, NC State had some great yes. teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so those are those were my teams as a as a real little kid. But then growing up is I tell you what, you go in, you go to Raleigh, you look up in them in them Raptors. They got as much history as anybody. People will forget yeah. that about NC State, rich basketball tradition. But all four of the all all of the big four are you know, and so what a great place. I mean, it's it's the mecca of college basketball on Tobacco Road. So to be a part of that was like. For me, a dream come true. Yeah. You know, I was just talking with my owner actually about ETSU. We were looking over this uh, to be corporate sponsors um, okay. pretty soon. And we were just kind of talking oh. about what that experience is like at Freedom Hall. It's, oh, man. You hear great things. Yeah, Freedom Hall, I mean, pound for pound is one of the best basketball atmospheres in the country. I mean, these people here, they love ETSU and everything. You know, we had a three-hour rain delay at the football game. Mm. I mean, incredible crowd three hours later after the rain. You know, and they but they love basketball. They've got we've got great basketball tradition here. I mean, we've had some moments in Freedom Hall where it's you know people are touching the roof, and it'll make the hair on your arm stand up. It is electric. It's loud. You know, it's got that false ceiling like the pit. You know, out of New Mexico, and so it, it gets really loud in there, and then and it's you know, and then it's pretty steep on the sides, and so you can, they can really get on top of you and uh, make it hard for an opponent to, to hear or execute, or you know, the the crowd definitely you know plays a part in the game. But we have tremendous fan support. We've led the the league in attendance, I mean, forever. Um, 
you know, they, they led the league in attendance again last year. You know, they love basketball. You, I mean, we tell, you know, our guys in recruiting and I mean, this is the, we're the main event. Like we're like the Lakers in town. I mean, they love hoops. And, um, you know, so we're excited to get going, but yeah, you got to come check out a game because it's a, it's a great atmosphere, especially, you know, when we can get it back rocking and, and, uh, you know, make it that, that, you know, the toughest place to play in the league. Is that part of why, uh, what brought you back? Because you obviously have been an assistant coach in Johnson city in the past and now coming back as a head coach, I was just curious, what are those things that made you say, I really got to take this opportunity? Yeah, I mean, it's a great community. I got two little girls, me and my wife. And so it's a great place to live, great place to raise a family. The, I mean, it's, it's, this is what you want, you know, in terms of community. And so uh, really good schools. So, you know, from that standpoint, it was A+. plus. But, yeah, there's just great people here. Like I said, they love – we're not in the shadow of anybody else. Like, we're not, like – this isn't a pro city. We don't have another major college – you know, right here, like this is ETSU country. You you go around town, it's blue and gold. And, um, you know, you got Virginia Tech a little to the north and Tennessee a little to the south, but right here in East Tennessee, this is ETSU. And so you want to coach at a place like that. It's got great tradition, great resources, great leadership, you know, from top-down alignment from our president and our, our, our athletic director and everyone involved. Um, they want to win. There's high expectations. And so it's a great, rich basketball tradition league. Jerry West played in this league. Steph Curry played in this league. I mean, there's been a number of good players. We had eight players in the NBA Summer League from the Southern Conference. I mean, there's not, this is the, a dream job. And there's nothing that you really don't have. And there's, and there's nothing not to like. And so um, the people in the community, just the, the, and to the level that you can win at um, here. You know, we did it last time. And so that's, that's the goal. You know, I think a lot of times when you take a job, you have an idea of how you want to do things. And maybe there's been, you know, pockets of success before, um, you know, and so you have a blueprint of how you think it'll work. But here we lived it. You know, Isaiah Tisdale is on our staff. Joe Hughley is on our staff. They played here on the 30 win team in 2020. So they know what that looks like. They know what that takes. They, and they they're aware of the expectation you know, here at ETSU, and that's to play on Monday night in Asheville. That's to go to the NCAA tournament. And we're not running from that, you know, and that's, but that's what you want. That's where you want to be. If that don't get you fired up, I can't help you. You know what I mean? So it's a great place. Um, you know, and, and I think um, if we can just keep building on what we got so far, you know, we can get it back to, to the, to the level at which they're accustomed to it being here over the last 50 years. Now, with that kind of community support, I would think that NIL could be something that could be uh, successful for a business. I've done a whole lot of work with NIL here in Knoxville, some in Chattanooga, but those are with like Tennessee Vols. Right. Sure. Uh, you know, but but I would imagine that a place like ETSU with that kind of community, kind of like you said, like you're the Lakers in town. So these athletes, they're they're spending all their time preparing for their craft for their sport. So I would love to, to find some ways to work with them and uh, get some opportunities. Have you gotten to work even at Wake Forest much with the NIL world? You know what? <laughs> no, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, you know, we, it was going to Wake Forest, you know, it was, it was challenging, you know, to getting off the ground because we got there, it was COVID we got there in May, like May 1st. And so, you know, the first year was tough. You know, we, we got shut down 30 days, like a lot of people, whatever. You know, the second year we were able to win 25 games. And then last year we had a, a nice team and a good year. But, you know, the changing landscape with the transfer portal, and how that, you know, was going to look at Wake Forest, where it's a little bit different. You know, here at ETSU, it's a lot more user-friendly. Um. But at Wake, you know, you, there's some challenges with transfer credits, which they've, you know, they've 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 worked with athletics to try and make that make that better. And then, um, you know, and then you have NIL. And so, what was that going to look like, you know, at Wake Forest? So we, you know, we were getting that together, and and they have a great setup now. Um, but those first couple of years, you know, we didn't really have it, and so 
now coming to UTSU, we're kind of in the same position as we were, I was as I was the last couple of years at Wake, and and figuring out what we're you know how competitive we're going to be in the space and what it's going to look like. And and listen, there is we we got a good thing going here. Uh, we got some people in the community that, like I said, that love basketball, love our players, and want to help them you know be successful. And so I think it's something that we can that we can grow and and build on, um, you know. But a lot of that. As a, I think as a, all head coaches, I think we're a little bit of like to be in control. And this is one thing that we really don't have much control over. And so, uh, but luckily we do have some good people that are into it in the community. I think it'll be something that's good for us. Yeah, I, I actually go speak to a class at UT once a semester uh, to help the athletes understand kind of what is expected of them. And just the main thing is helping them learn what an ROI is and like these businesses, that's what they want and that's what they need. So, but still with, with you being the the main gun in town and everybody says like, this is a basketball school. Um, so I, uh, I would imagine there's certainly going to be some opportunities for those kids. Yeah, I think there will be, like I said, it's a, uh, you know, you got some, some people that really love ETSU and, and the, it's just the basketball tradition here is so good. You know, we're, we're, it sounds cliche. Coach Pearl says it all the time at Auburn. We're in everything school, but ETSU, I mean, it is the last time we were here. Football was winning the Southern Conference and, and playing the playoffs. We have an incredible golf program. They've been to the NCAA tournament three straight times. Volleyball is picked to win the league. Women's basketball is incredible. On tennis is one like every year for, you know, we got, we got, I mean, we're good at, at a lot of stuff. And so, and they, they love it here. But so I think, you know, this community really rallies around ETSU. So I think that it'll be, you know, advantageous for our student athletes for sure. Yeah. So coach, one thing I like to in the headspace of is the 14 year old inside all of us. Uh, and it, it, that's something personally with me every week, I try to do something that I think would impress 14 year old Casey. So 14 year old Brooks, would he, um, what would you think of your career and what would, what advice would you give to that same kid now that might think, you know, I want to, I'm going to be a B1 basketball coach, but physically I'm not prepared. I'm not going to be a player. Yeah. Uh, it's such a great question. And and I'm like a, a little bit of a romantic when it comes to stuff like that, because this has been a childhood dream for me. Um, you know, I, I can remember being in my room when I'm eight years old, you know, playing on the nerf hoop by myself and I, you know, I always, you know, I loved college basketball from, from forever, but I love the coaches. Like I can remember going and watching Nolan Richardson's teams at Arkansas or, or Rick Bettino at Kentucky or, you know, who, who, you name it, you know, Roy Williams was at Kansas. I have, I still, in my room at home at my parents' house, there's a Kansas poster on the wall with Kirk Heinrich, and Nick Collison. Like I loved Billy Donovan was at Florida. I mean, you know, whoever. So, um, so I have always wanted to do this, I always dreamed of, of doing this. And so, um, you know, I think it's, I'm, I'm lucky that I get to live a passion, right? You know, not a lot of people get to, to go to work every day and do something that they love. And so 14 year old self, would I don't, I don't know. I think he'd kind of be like, damn, dude, you, you did it. You know, like, I think he, he would be proud. Um, you know, because it's not, it's not been an, e an easy road. Like, you know, there's, you know, it's been step by step. I don't think I've been able to, to really skip any steps. Um, and I'm thankful for that because I think that it's made me the most prepared that I could be. Well, you know, you know, we'll see how successful I, you know, I am at this or, or I'm not, you know, how much we can win and we'll see, you know, um, we got, like I said, we got good players and a great staff and we'll work our tail off. But, um, yeah, I just think that, that, um, you know, it's, I think it can be an inspiration to other people. I think when my girls look at their dad, you know, that they'll, they'll be able to, you know, to see that if you can put your mind to it and you're willing to, to work for it, that you can, you know, dreams come true. And so that's really the, you know, I think that what I'll take away from it is that hopefully it'll help somebody else, you know, believe in, in their dream. Yeah. Uh, real quick. I'm just curious. Cause I remembered that you mentioned that you grew up in Columbia. 
Mm -hmm. Is that right? So why were you a Tennessee fan? What brought you to um, UT? Yeah, my dad. Delusia. Phil and my dad went there and and um fell in love with the place and then would you know would would take me there in the fall for football games you know there's actually a picture in the Knoxville News Sentinel you can find it online if you don't, I don't think you have to really look that hard about every year they they do like a like a history of photos for UT Florida games and there's like a picture like from the Knoxville News Sentinel like I have my face painted like at the game I'm like 10 years old so you know it was uh it was just kind of um something that we Do you know which did. one that was uh i think it was the one where we got just crushed in the rain i want to say peyton manning was the quarterback i think he threw the interception to like uh the george kid for florida he ran it back for a touchdown i don't know 96 maybe mm. something like that we're actually recording this on florida week so yeah um I actually I met my, my wife at a party, a viewing party for in uh, 98 when Tennessee beat Florida. Oh, for real? So I, I met my wife at that at one of those. I mean, we were both in high school, but yeah, that was that's a fun no, the no Surrey game. Yep. Um, sorry. So uh, one last question I ask everybody. Share with me one great sports memory for you, be it as a player, coach or even as a spectator. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot as I've been in college basketball. You know, beating Ohio State to go to the Sweet 16 was awesome when I was in school. Um, you know, some of the games, like when we won the SEC down at Florida, that was really cool. Uh, you know, playing the national championship in Juco. There's been a no, you know, getting to coach the game. Coach Forbes actually got thrown out the first year, and I had to, I got to coach the second half against Coach K. Now, um we got we were getting crushed but it was that was kind of cool there's been some moments like that I would say outside of basketball um me and my dad went to the being an Orioles fan I'm actually going on Thursday to the Rays Orioles game in, in Baltimore but um we were at Cal Ripken's 21 30 and 21 31 so that was really oh. cool yeah like that's not that's one that's not ever getting broken um got his autograph and that sort of thing and so that was probably like peak sports moment for me. Heck yeah. That's great, man. Well, uh, real quick, tell me how's this season going to go for uh, ETSU? How's the team uh, look? I don't know how it'll go, but but I, I like where we're at. We had a great summer. We got a really, really good players, uh, super coachable. Uh, they get along well with one another. Um, they're buying in to, to, to how we want to play. And I think they're having fun with it um they're fun to coach i know that i've had some teams where you kind of dread going to practice <laughs> some days but this group's been been good they're hard working coachable we're just trying to get it you know we want to be the hardest playing best condition most connected toughest team that's what we're trying to work towards being every day and if we can do that i think we'll have some success um you know like i said staff's working hard spending a lot of time with them because it is a largely new team we're going to have 11 new players like we're trying to build those relationships quickly. But, you know, everybody's new, though. Even the returning players, all the coaches, all the players are new. The returning guys have been awesome, um, you know, that were here last year. They got a lot of, like, blood, sweat, and tears in this program. And, uh, you know, so, you know, we're just trying to, to, to get this thing back to where it's been so many times in history. And uh, I think that they – they're they're – I like this group. They have a little bit of a – an edge to them there's a little bit of chip on their shoulder it's quiet it's not like it's not a lot of false bravado and and stuff like that but there's a de quiet determination about this group i think and so um i like i like where we're at we got a lot of work to do but I, today on september the 11th um i like where we're at right well etsu head coach brooks savage thank you so much best of luck this season man Thanks, Casey. Appreciate you having me. Sure thing.